The topic for today is open channel flow. So anytime you have something like a stream or a river that's going to be flowing confined on the bottom by the stream bed or the rock, whatever's below it, and an open surface, right, open to atmospheric pressure up top, we call that open channel flow. So obviously in hydrogeology, like I said, this is going to be streams, rivers, that kind of thing. So if you think of this as a longitudinal section of the river here, where the water's flowing from left to right, then you might be able to draw the flow profile on this thing. And we have a couple ways of doing this. Um, and the first thing to note is we'll usually define the bottom right here. And of course, I've drawn it as a hopefully straight line here, flat. But in reality, you're going to have little rocky or oh, Let's get the, the pen working. You'll have little bumps, you know imperfections on the on the floor um, you'll have elevation changes right this will rarely be perfectly flat um, but ignoring the, the inaccuracies of the picture you'll have at the bottom what's called the no slip condition which means that at the physical contact between the water and the floor right there's no velocity of the water and that should intuitively make sense right the water, as you get closer and closer to touching that rock, should, it's it's a limit. It's going to approach zero as it reaches it. And then once you make that infinitesimal transition in space between water and rock, you hit where it's exactly zero. So for that reason, our velocity profiles are going to look something like, if this is our y-axis, right, going from zero off the floor up to the surface of the stream, then we might draw it like something like this, where this represents, these lines represent the magnitude of the stream flow, the velocity of the flow. And of course the triangle is nice because it, it's really simple, it makes our calculations easy in, in terms of getting an average velocity along this profile, right? You just find smack dab in the middle whatever the height there is divided by two, whatever the maximum velocity is divided by two, that's gonna be your average flow. But of course, in reality, that's usually not what it's like. We have a whole bunch of different ways of modeling what the exact flow profile would be. Sometimes you'll see it look more, more parabolic in nature, something maybe a little bit more like that. And these lines would be stretching outwards like so. And of course, this makes it look more like what you would expect, which is the transition from being at the maximum flow to the minimum zero flow happens a lot more suddenly as you approach the floor. And this is, of course, all based on the, the exact friction at play between the water and the floor. Um, so there's no kind of one size fits all simulation for this. But that's what it looks like in like I said, a longitudinal section. And now there's also some interesting things to talk about if we were to give ourselves a view of a cross section of the stream, right? So let's go from this to something. I'll give us a couple of options here. Streams are interesting in cross section because they don't fit into something nice. Like when we're dealing with fluid mechanics and internal flow, it's nice to have a, a nice, easy shape to deal with when we're talking about flow through something, right? Like if you have a pipe, then you can make it a circular diameter and then getting the flow through that, the mass flow rate or volumetric flow rate is really easy because it's a constant cross-sectional area. And the only time things get a little bit complicated might be where you have elbows, bends, you know, or if the pipe is, is getting clogged and the volume is shrinking in certain parts. But for the most part, it's a lot nicer. Here we've got things that, you know, stream bed, the profile of stream is going to be no given shape. If we're dealing with a man-made canal, canal, excuse me, instead of a instead of a natural stream, then it might be slightly different. But for now, the best ways we might approximate the area of a stream, if we're doing kind of simple back of the envelope con calculations, would be to draw it either as a rectangle, where we know roughly the width of it and we know roughly the height of it or maybe a circle, a semicircle here, a half circle, um, where we would know the diameter of it based on the width. And of course, just measuring the width of a stream can be done uh, pretty easily, just measuring length, getting across a stream, maybe not so much, but that's where we have things like bridges um, or even better surveying equipment. 
So if we look at what the water profile might look like here, then we'd say the water is going like this, right? And it's coming, it's flowing at us from the back of the page up out of the page. And there's a couple useful things we can do from looking at this cross-section. One, we can get the cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area is useful because that allows us to calculate the mass flow rate and also the Reynolds number. We'll get into both of those. The mass flow rate for any section is going to be the... I'll write this out. The mass flow rate is equal to the density times the area times the velocity. So the density, of course, that's... Let's work the units out on these. That's going to be kilograms per meter cubed, using the metric system here, multiplied by the area is going to be in meters squared, and the velocity is going to be in meters per second. We can look at this meters squared times a meter just going to give us meters cubed. So these all cancel out, and we're left with kilograms per second for our final units there. So that's how it makes, how unit-wise, we can confirm that that works out. You can also think of it as we have density a certain amount of mass moving per unit time through a slice of area, right? Um, so hopefully that should that should be pretty easy to grasp. But rho a v, pretty basic for all for all fluid flow stuff. So finding a is of course important. So using these approximations, right? If we say that there's some height here and some width here, then getting the area of that rectangle is as easy as height times width. If we're looking at the half circle here, then we would say that this is maybe the diameter. And then getting the area of a circle is, of course, pi over 4 d squared. And then you have to consider, well, it's not a full circle, it's a half circle. So we would divide that by 2 again to give us pi over 8 d squared. So that's just kind of how we would work the areas. Of course, if you have more sophisticated methods of finding the cross-sectional area of a stream, then you don't have to work with this. Like I said, this is mostly for quick, quick and dirty calculations. And then the last thing to talk about here is, well, two terms that are going to be useful for us in finding the Reynolds number. And that is the hydraulic diameter, which is usually denoted by D sub H. That's the hydraulic diameter, which refers to for non-circular channels or pipes or whatever you're flowing through, ducts. That's going to be the ratio of the area to the perimeter. Um, so for a circle, obviously the diameter is going to come out. The hydraulic diameter is just the diameter. For something like a rectangle, though, it's going to work out differently. So dH equals area over perimeter. And there's also a concept called the wetted perimeter, which is going to be useful for us here, because obviously in a stream, if you just got the, the height from, let's say, the surface of the stream down to the bottom, that's not going to cut it. We want the wetted perimeter, which is where the water is actually touching. So we want the height specifically of the water, the water level in the stream that it's flowing through. And then we would, for this rectangle, for example, the wetted perimeter, uh, P w might be equal to 2hw plus w and that's what we would use in our wetted perimeter and we divide that through to get the hydraulic diameter and it's useful to have this hydraulic diameter for float for paths that or cross-sectional areas that aren't perfect semicircles because when we're talking about the reynolds number there's another thing to introduce RE, that's the Reynolds number, which is, an, it gives you an idea of the, the speed, the movement inertia versus the viscous inertia of the fluid. I think I got that right. Thinking of it in terms of that is kind of useful for guiding our thoughts here, because what it's used to test is whether the flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. So the actual equation here, RE is equal to rho V d over mu. And the stipulation here, in the rawest terms, sometimes you'll see it written that r e x is equal to rho v x over mu, right? And that 
little x down there is denoting that there's some dimension here because it really doesn't matter. The, the, the Reynolds number is a dimensionless quantity. It's not some physical, it's not something we can really physical see. It's a dimensionless quantity to give us an idea of how the flow is going to behave. So we can define this, this x term here to be anything that's as long as it's a length, then it'll come out as a dimensionless number. So in our case, we're looking at, you know, some people sat down and this was, this was first done in the case of internal flow through pipes. And they said, well, what's the best thing to use, you know, for, for finding a Reynolds number that can be used in determining whether the flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. And they determined that that was the diameter of the pipe, not the, not the, let's say, longitudinal length, not the whatever other lengths you could determine from a pipe. You know, they said diameter. And so when transitioning that to open channel flow or any flow where it's not in a perfectly circular pipe, like I said, another good example of that would be something like a, a rectangular air duct for a ventilation system. Then we're going to use the hydraulic diameter. So for us, this X we're going to plug in here, this is going to become rho V, that hydraulic diameter D sub H divided by mu. Where rho is the density, V is the velocity, DH is the hydraulic diameter, and mu is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid, of water in this case. That's not to be confused with the kinematic uh, viscosity, but those are two different things. And don't need to get into that right now. Uh, and then the one final thing to mention, I guess, would be what is the point in knowing the difference between laminar and turbulent, right? With, the, with stream channels, a lot of times if there's turbulence, you know, you'll see it kind of splash up and it'll do these hydraulic jumps and you'll see the, the white at the surface of the water, right? A lot of stream flow is highly turbulent, but let's say you're you're digging a, a canal and this might be in your power to determine whether certain segments of the flow are going to be laminar or turbulent. Or looking how water is going to interact around uh, dams or wires or whatever, you know, this can become a powerful tool. And for internal flow like this, we usually say that the cutoff between laminar and turbulent flow is 2300. Which is to say, if it's less than 2300, we would expect it to be laminar. If it's greater than 2300, we would expect it to be turbulent. The transition isn't perfectly cut and clear, right? They usually describe it as a transition zone. But usually it's around here where we would expect to start seeing the effects of turbulence take place. And that's what's going to change our water from being nice and, for the most part, straight flow lines to you know, going more, more crazy and wild and splashing up at the surface and all that whatnot. And as you can imagine, it's a lot nicer dealing with laminar flow in terms of calculations and the average velocities, right? This whole thing here assumes laminar flow, that there's some profile, that it's mostly traveling strictly in the X direction there. If there's turbulence, we're going to get some velocity in the Y direction as well. And it's going to, you know, really change things up. So that's a brief introduction to some of the guiding principles behind open channel flow. Hope that was useful.